In the midst of post-World War II decolonization, the landlocked nation in the heart of Africa, Uganda, gained independence in 1962. And so like many of its British ex-neighbors, Uganda went to the voting booth to decide their new government. Now, the first election didn't satisfy many Bugandans. Uganda was kind of like a kingdom within Uganda, as not many of them really voted. And then a second election happened just a year later with Milton Obote winning the election. Now, Obote had formed an alliance with the Bugandans and agreed to make their king, the Kabaka, the president of Uganda. It was basically a ceremonial title, but one that did recognize the significance of the Bugandans. Ever the savvy politician though, Obote came to disregard the Kabaka and gradually phased him out of public life. After all, he felt he didn't need the support of the Bugandans with the strength of his army, led by his loyal new general, Idi Amin, who, despite failing multiple army exams, had impressed the British so much that they gave him many promotions before they departed Uganda in 1962. The Kabaka continued to make noise though about being phased out, and he was a source of instability. And so, Obote's response was swift. In response to being implicated in an ivory smuggling plot, the new boss Idi Amin was sent to deal with the Kabaka. In 1966, Amin's tanks attacked the palace walls and the Kabaka's guards were no match for Amin's disciplined soldiers. The Kabaka had no choice but to flee, and Obote had established control over Uganda thanks to his loyal army. Hello there. Okay, so for the first time in Mr. Mitchell history, we reached the continent of Africa. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss our History of Modern China series and to catch up on our most recent episodes of Enemies of the West. Now, the whole 1966 Kabakul was a massive win for Obote with one huge caveat. It showed his dependence on the army. If he wasn't going to play ball with the Bugandans, he had to then give massive authority to the army. Now, like I said, Obote was a canny operator and he started to become increasingly wary of Amin as the head of the army. And by 1970, it was really a matter of who could oust the other first without it being a complete PR disaster. Obote groomed Pierino Okoya to replace Amin, but shockingly, Okoya and his wife were murdered in 1970. Now, no guesses who was implicated in the murder, and an investigation was launched against Idi Amin. So, Obote fires him here, right? He's under a murder investigation. Well, no. If Obote did that, then he risked soldiers pledging their loyalty to Amin and then turning on him. Instead, Obote had to discredit Amin without his soldiers quite catching on. And so, Obote moved Amin sideways from Chief of Staff to Chief of Defense, and that was the exact same move to oust Amin's predecessor, Shabani Opoloto. He also tried to publicly shame Amin without it being obvious that he was publicly shaming him. For example, he sent Amin to speak on a panel on state television. Amin could barely understand some of the questions being asked of him in English and was made to look like a complete idiot. And so from Amin's point of view, if he was to retain his position of power and to avoid a potential murder conviction once he got dumped as the army chief, he had to act fast. And his chance came in 1971 when Milton Obote went to a Commonwealth summit in Singapore. Amin ordered his soldiers to take Kampala and seal off in Tebe International Airport, and they blocked off major roads and surrounded Obote's residence. Amin, once an enemy of Uganda, brought them back on side by agreeing to hold a state funeral for their Kabaka. Now, interestingly, Britain could have stopped this, and we know from documents released 30 years afterwards that Britain knew Amin's coup was about to unfold. However, they wanted Obote gone. Obote had nationalized much of the Ugandan economy and Obote wanted to have the government have a 51% share in all foreign and Asian owned industries. Uganda is mineral rich and this would have been fatal for British profits had he actually gone ahead with the nationalization. Obote was also an outspoken critic of Britain not doing anything to end the illegal regime of Ian Smith in Rhodesia. And so with Obote gone, Amin made quick friends with Britain and initially had positive relations with Israel. There was a lot of Western positivity surrounding the Amin regime, however in 1972, his approach to Asian Ugandans started to change this. The term Asians was basically a shorthand way of referring to immigrants from Commonwealth nations such as India and Pakistan, and then from Israel too. They tended to be dominant in the retail community, and many of the Ugandan Asians were simply more prosperous than the black Ugandans. This led to something not too dissimilar to the Jewish conspiracy myth in Nazi Germany, where a generally prosperous minority race were made to be the scapegoats for the hardship of majority races. And the anti-Asian drum was an easy one for Idi Amin to beat, and he accused Asian Ugandans of conspiring to not lease property to African businessmen, and told a likely fabricated story of an Asian woman who'd written to him in despair after her parents disapproved of her marriage to an African Ugandan. Fearing what was to come, many Asians started to flee Uganda. For Amin, this was a problem because it meant taking their money out of Uganda. Amin pivoted and began to rebuild bridges with the Asian community and held an Asian conference with key leaders in Entebbe. And once Asian confidence was restored in Amin, he decided that'd be the time he attacked. He ordered all Asians to leave Uganda in 90 days or face imprisonment. This gave them no time to transfer their assets out of Uganda, forcing Asians to flee to Commonwealth nations like Britain, Canada, and India, 
with their wealth stuck in Uganda for the Amin regime to take. Amin described it as giving back Uganda to Ugandans. And Amin divided the opinion of fellow African leaders, but he gained a lot of admiration from Africans all across the continent and was a symbol of black strength in reclaiming Africa after white colonization. There's two famous photos that Amin was keen to have circulated. The first, a photo of Amin being carried by four white businessmen on a throne into a party, and the second, a photo of 14 white people kneeling before Amin in a deceptively staged photo. Amin's expulsion of the Asians, his declaration of support for Palestine, and the fact that he showed he'd be far from a puppet severed Uganda's relationship with Britain, and in fact he held a British man hostage to leverage talks with him. Dennis Hills was a British lecturer in Uganda who criticised Amin's regime and was sentenced to death for espionage and sedition. Amin told the British he'd spare Hills if they sent Foreign Secretary James Callaghan, and eventually Britain conceded and Callaghan went to meet Amin. Callaghan boasted that no concessions to Amin were made, but the fact that he went in the first place was seen as enough of a concession to have it construed that Amin had outwitted the British. And like I said, Amin began his reign as somewhat pro-Israel, however after Israel agreed to give him aid through the form of infrastructure projects like hospitals rather than cash and military equipment, Amin turned to the Arab world and as a fellow Muslim threw his weight behind Palestine. And this is important context for Operation Entebbe in 1976. This is basically the climax of The Last King of Scotland, the famous fictional film about Nicholas Garrigan, set in a very real context of 1976 Uganda. In June of 1976, a flight from Tel Aviv to Paris was hijacked by Palestinian extremists who redirected the flight to Entebbe, where Amin allowed them to stay. The aim was to hold the passengers hostage until 53 Palestinian political prisoners who were mostly held in Israel were set free. Amin supported the hijackers and gave them extra troops and weapons. He was known for having a flair for the dramatic and really reveled in the attention that was on him. Amin negotiated the release of all non-Israeli passengers, but he had a big Achilles heel in this particular instance. Entebbe Airport was actually built by Israelis prior to the Asian expulsion, and Israel had the blueprint to the airport. This gave way to Operation Thunderbolt, where three Israeli aircraft escorted fighter planes to land in Entebbe and then stormed the airport. The standoff saw seven hijackers, 20 Ugandan officers, three hostages, and even one Israeli, Jonathan Netanyahu, who is Benjamin's brother, who were killed in the operation. The passengers were taken to be processed and to recover in Kenya. And for Amin, Kenya's support was treachery and he threatened invasion against them. For this, Kenya whacked Uganda with a trade embargo, and it's really hard to understate just how badly Uganda were crippled by this. Firstly, Uganda was in debt to Kenya. Secondly, nearly all of their oil came from Kenya. And then finally, Uganda was a landlocked country and relied on Kenya's seaports for all of its imports and exports. It even reached the point where Amin's own army staff were questioning whether he should be the leader of Uganda still. Amin relented and ultimately changed tact. Instead, he heaped praise on Jomo Kenyatta for his smart leadership and trade resumed between the two once again. The Amin regime executed many, but amongst the most notable was Anglican Archbishop Lewum. Now, this didn't mobilize Christians in Uganda because they were too scared of Amin, but it certainly mobilized the Christians in surrounding countries and contributed to the narrative that Amin was transforming a majority Christian country into an Islamic country. And with Uganda's economy in tatters, Amin attempted to invade Kagera, a northern province of Tanzania, using troops from Gaddafi's Libya and from Sudan and Zaire. Now, notice at the start that I said that Obote was gone, but I didn't tell you where. You see, Milton Obote had taken refuge in Tanzania. And so when Amin attempted an invasion, that's when Obote struck back. Obote merged his militia force with Julius Nyeri's Tanzanian military, and they advanced to take back Kagera. Amin's defenses were only 25% Ugandan, and so the Libyans in particular fled and surrendered to the advancing Tanzanians. Amin had no way out, and so he fled to Gaddafi's Libya, and then later to Saudi Arabia, where he died in 2003. Obote would return to govern Uganda until he was actually overthrown again in 1985, but that's another story. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to become an expert in the world around us. Next time on Enemies of the West, we're going down under to look at another Commonwealth leader who annoyed the British in the 1970s, Gough Whitlam. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.